park historian Jim Ogden stands, forward-facing, in uniform of a tan flat hat, gray shirt, green jacket, and green trousers. He stands at the base of a slight rise, next to a brown sign with the National Park Service Arrowhead logo and white lettering. A narrow path leads to the top of the rise through a small group of trees. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today uh, for this program that the National Military Park is presenting to this year virtually recognize the 157th anniversary of the battles for Chattanooga, the concluding series of engagements in the by then almost six month long campaign for Chattanooga in 1863. We're here today at Orchard Knob Many recognize Orchard Knob as the first action of the battles for Chattanooga on uh, those 23rd, 24th, and 25th days of November in 1863. But it is most often recognized as that command post, that point of observation for the senior union leadership, Ulysses S. Grant, George Thomas, and others on the final day of the battles for Chattanooga, November 25, 1863. The action here on the 23rd gets less attention and is less widely recognized. And exactly what Orchard Knob was on that 23rd of November is not usually uh, acknowledged. This was part of the Confederate picket line in front of um, the Confederate lines along Missionary Ridge to the east. And in fact, this sector of the line was under the responsibility of the 24th Alabama of Arthur Middleton Manigo's brigade uh, in Hindman's division, then under the command of James Patton Anderson. The 24th Alabama had their uh, picket reserve and picket station in the ground just to the northeast of um, the uh, Orchard Knob itself. And in fact, that is where on that Monday, November 23rd, 1863, the commander of that regiment, Colonel Newton Davis, was, and he had just begun a letter. On the 23rd of November, being on picket with my regiment and everything being apparently quiet, I commenced writing you a letter and had written about a, a dozen lines when a messenger from the front arrived giving me the information that the enemy were advancing upon us in strong force. I immediately pocketed what I had written and ran up to the top of the hill a short distance to my left where I could get a good view of everything that was approaching from the front. We might not run up to the top of the hill, but let's be like Colonel Davis and go up and find out what's happening in that early afternoon of November the 23rd, 1863. Park historian Jim Ogden turns and begins walking up the slight rise behind him towards the top. Park historian Jim Ogden stands forward facing in a mowed grassy area. He stands at the top of a slight rise behind and a little bit below him are trees and houses. In the distance to his right rises Lookout Mountain, behind him rises Raccoon Mountain, and to his left rises Walden's Ridge. We, like Colonel Davis, have now made it to the top of um, Orchard Knob. And Davis, in his, um, his letter some days after the, uh, the battles for Chattanooga, um, would, uh, would relate his experience uh, of having arrived up here on that 23rd of November. To my astonishment, when I reached the top of the hill, I beheld the enemy uh, deployed in two lines of battle and a third line and column closed in mass. My first impression was that they were preparing for a review. He was quite surprised by the appearance on the ground to the west of him 
on the slopes of the rise on which Federal Fortification Fort Wood was located. The mass of Federal soldiers having filed out and formed up in seeming battle array. But his initial thought that this was uh, perhaps just a review was a thought held by many other Confederate leaders that day. For as Davis and others reported the Federals massing in late morning and early afternoon, the belief was that it was not, not a sign of a direct advance, um, but just a uh, review or formation uh, that the Federals had periodically done during the course of the siege. In fact, 10 days earlier, on the 13th of November, just a little bit to the south of Fort Wood, an entire Confederate or an entire Federal division had marched out of the fort or fortifications and in the plain or flat ground in front of the Union line, they had formed three sides of a square. And for Confederate observers that day on Orchard Knob, its um, adjacent uh, rise on its southern shoulder, or for some, from some point on Missionary Ridge itself, they um, uh, wondered initially what that formation was. And they saw then a small party of Union soldiers march around that, um, that interior of uh, that three-sided formation and then halt on the open side. And then it became clear it was a execution. In fact, two deserters were executed by the Union Army on November the 13th. And so periodically, Union forces had indeed uh, moved out into the ground immediately in front of their fortifications and within their own uh, picket line or skirmish line. And the initial thought on this 23rd was that it was another such review. But as Davis goes on in, um, in his letter, the actual purpose of that formation was soon made clear. I heard the order given to load at will, and then I knew something more serious than a review was intended. And indeed it was. With the opening in late October of a new supply line into Chattanooga, the Cracker Line, the then commander of the military division of the Mississippi, the um, Major General Ulysses S. Grant, the, um, the new commander of the new geographic command of the Union Army, that area between the Appalachian Mountains on the east and the Mississippi River on the, uh, the west. Ulysses S. Grant had wanted to take the offensive. However, by that late October, early November time period, the Union Army of the Cumberland, having been cooped up in a one square mile area of Chattanooga for a month, living at the end of a very tenuous supply route um, that had almost literally starved much of the Army's horse and mule flesh to, to death, the Army of the Cumberland was essentially immobile. And Grant did not have the force by which he could actually take the offensive. He was going to have to await the arrival of some of his old troops, troops of the Army of the Tennessee that he had commanded in the um, uh, successful campaign for the seizure of Vicksburg in the spring and summer of 1863. That army was now commanded by Grant's most trusted subordinate, William Tecumseh Sherman, and when Grant had been ordered to uh, take the new position of commander of the military division of the Mississippi, Sherman received the uh, directive to bring a portion of the Army of the Tennessee as reinforcements to the Chattanooga area. They were moved by steamboat from Vicksburg to Memphis, and while a few of them got to um, ride uh, the rails uh, eastward for Memphis um, or eastward from Memphis for a short distance. Uh, from that point, they then will march mo towards Chattanooga. March during a time period when there was extensive rain and the water courses flooded. In fact, the Elk River was flooded so badly that Sherman's column had to march 60 miles out of its way 
um, and to find a place to cross that flooded water course en route to Chattanooga. And this means that first one week, and then a second week, and then a third week after the um, opening of the new supply line in Chattanooga passes. Finally, Sherman himself will arrive in, um, in Chattanooga on November the 15th, and Grant and Sherman and George Thomas, Union Quartermaster General Montgomery Miggs, and other Union officers will then begin to scout the idea for an offensive to drive the Confederates away from Chattanooga, drive the Confederates from their position along the western base of Missionary Ridge, across Chattanooga Valley between Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain, and potentially from Lookout Mountain itself. With the dominating height of Lookout Mountain, Grant had no intention of attacking the Confederates on that um, strong point um, as a major part of, um, of his attack. Um, with Sherman's men coming in from the west, when they marched into Lookout Valley on the west side of Lookout Mountain, they would march northward through the northern end of Lookout Valley, cross the Tennessee River at the, on the pontoon bridge at Browns Ferry, that vital um, uh, link across the Tennessee River by which supplies for the Union Army in Chattanooga were delivered on a daily basis, and Sherman's men would then go into hiding in the hills of Stringer's Ridge on the north side of the Tennessee River and north of Chattanooga um, in the community of Red Bank today, uh, mostly along what is Memorial Drive in Red Bank. Some of those troops, as they marched in from the west, would um, do so during daylight hours uh, and be, of course, observed by Confederates on Lookout Mountain um, and other high points. Um, but it was hoped by Grant that by seeing them cross the pontoon bridge at Browns Ferry and then march northward, um, uh, essentially out of sight behind the hills of Stringer's Ridge and northeastward as they disappeared, it would be believed that they were being marched towards Knoxville to um, offset the Confederate effort under James Longstreet following Bragg's orders to try to recapture Knoxville. Other of Sherman's men, as they completed the march from Memphis, would make the crossing of the pontoon bridge at Browns Ferry under the cover of darkness and move into the hills of Stringer's Ridge under the cover of darkness as well. And there they would be, uh, be camped, as it turned out, for several days, awaiting the arrival of uh, the rest of their troops. But once um, Sherman's force was in um, hiding in the hills of Missionary Ridge, the plan that Grant developed called for Sherman's command to move over to the banks of the Tennessee River, north or upstream of Chattanooga, and cross the Tennessee River near the mouth of South Chickamauga Creek, um, and then move over and attack the Confederate right flank along the western base of Missionary Ridge. Grant wanted to execute this assault as early as Saturday, the 21st of November. But Sherman's final approach march to Chattanooga was um, uh, not conducted as well as um, it could have been, and it was challenged by the terrible condition of the road coming through Running Water Creek Gap, uh, made worse by the, all of the recent rain, including rain on some of those very days of the approach march, and Sherman's um, uh, march was slowed by the uh, poor condition of the road and the need to move wheel vehicles across that road as well. And so Grant has to um, postpone his, on the 20th of November, he has to postpone the attack from the 21st to the 22nd. And when Sherman's men are still not in position on the 21st, that day Sherman has to postpone the attack from the 22nd to the 23rd. And when Sherman's men are still not in position on the um, 22nd, Grant has to postpone the attack once again. But on that same day, November the 22nd, intelligence comes to Ulysses S. Grant 
which causes him to um, wonder about the condition of the Confederate Army around Chattanooga. On November the 22nd, Union, Union observers on the uh, Union fortification line on the east side of Chattanooga, and principally at the large fortification on that side, Fort Wood, which stood on that um, wooded knoll today, uh, the roofs of some houses sticking through the, uh, through the trees there, um, but also from then much higher Cameron Hill and the uh, signal station on Cranes Hill on the north side of the river. Union observers had seen Confederate troops marching with their knapsacks on and accompanied by wagons and ambulances and their artillery and move over Missionary Ridge and disappear to the east. And um, uh, those reports were, um, reached Grant on the 22nd and on the morning of the 23rd, reports came to Grant from Confederate deserters, men who had come into Union lines from the Confederate lines overnight on the night of the 22nd and the early morning hours of the 23rd. And they reported Confederate troop movements as well. And for Grant, if significant numbers of Confederate troops were leaving here, perhaps the entire army, it meant that maybe Bragg was abandoning his, his positions around Chattanooga and Bragg might be moving the 110 miles to the northeast to join the effort to try to recapture Knoxville. And Ulysses S. Grant, um, reflecting his um, uh, full appreciation of how um, uh, affairs military and political intertwined at that um, high level of command that he then occupied, knowing uh, Abraham Lincoln's long-standing desire to uh, occupy East Tennessee, that region of the volunteer state with very strong sentiment op opposed to the idea of Southern independence by secession and the creation of the Confederate States of America. Uh, Lincoln had, from the beginning of the war, had hoped to get East Tennessee, to use it as part of the base um, on which to reconstruct one of the seceded states. Grant was well aware of this and certainly did not want to see any potential Confederate success that would allow them to once again reoccupy East Tennessee where there had just been a small Union force since um, late August and early September under Ambrose Burnside. And so Grant, wanting to try to learn more about the status of the Confederate Army around Chattanooga on November the 23rd, that morning, um, will order George Thomas to, um, uh, to conduct a demonstration against the Confederate um, uh, skirmish or picket line in front of M Missionary Ridge to try to get the Confederates to show their force um, to give Grant some idea of um, Confederate intentions at that particular moment, while at the same time Sherman's men continue to uh, make their final movement um, in their approach march. A friend of Union Quartermaster General Montgomery Miggs was here, and he will write in a letter just after the, uh, the action in November. Monday morning, General Grant came over and quietly announced that the movement, anticipated some time since, would con uh, commence. Sure enough, it did. That movement would be this demonstration um, by which he directs George Thomas to um, push against the Confederate picket or skirmish line um, centered here on Orchard Knob. And for George Thomas, the commander of the Army of the Cumberland, his orders then go to his two corps commanders, Gordon Granger and his 4th Corps, and John Palmer and his 14th Corps. And Granger and Palmer are to move troops of their corps out of their positions around Chattanooga and form them up. And in particular, Thomas J. Wood's division of the 4th Corps um, would, uh, would form up and be aimed directly at Orchard Knob. Orchard Knob, as you can see, rises above the general lay of the, um, uh, of the valley, Chattanooga Valley, in which it, um, it sits. 
Um, its highest point is here near its uh, northern end, and it extends southward as a short ridge line with a second rise or knoll a little bit further to the south. It was uh, mostly open at the time and indeed was the site of an orchard from an earlier farmstead. Um, and the Confederates had incorporated this into, its, or into their um, forward positions, their skirmish line or picket line um, confronting the Federals um, here on the east side of Chattanooga. And Orchard Knob was a, essentially a fortified high point, but not fortified very extensively. No um, extensive field fortifications on the top of it here. Um, and um, in fact, no real defensive um, scheme developed amongst the units then occupying the skirmish or picket line um, on how to potentially use or even defend um, Orchard Knob. But um, Wood deployed his division on the slope of, um, of Fort Wood below the, um, uh, the fortification uh, um, and um, he formed two of his three brigades um, on his, or as his, um, his main strike force coming directly towards Orchard Knob would be the brigade commanded by Brigadier General August Villick. Um, Villick would, um, would deploy uh, four of his, um, his regiments uh, online in line of battle and then the rest of his brigade was formed uh, closed column um, in mass um, uh, at an interval behind. Hazen's brigade was formed similarly to the south or to the right of um, Villick and was aimed at the lower southern knoll of uh, Orchard Knob. Um, Wood's third brigade under Sam Beatty was deployed to Villick's left rear um, and to support this um, move other Union troops had moved out into the valley as well. The uh, two divisions of um, O.O. Howard's 11th Corps, which had been moved into um, Chattanooga on November the um, 22nd. They are formed up and ready to support as well. Um, and also the um, divisions under Phil Sheridan and Absalom Baird move out um, in support as well. Since the purpose is to try to determine the exact status of the Confederate Army, um, Fort Wood becomes a, um, uh, the principal observation point um, and uh, many of the luminaries of the Union Command will, um, will gather there. In fact, um, a, um, uh, a, a, a relative of Grant's wife, Julia, um, who is, um, is visiting um, uh, his um, uh, cousin's husband, uh, Grant, here in, um, in Chattanooga. He, um, in a journal of that visit, will, um, will record, at one o'clock, the general, meaning Grant, tells me to take the elegant brown horse presented to him by General Miggs and ride with him. We go in company with General Hunter and others to Fort Wood. General Thomas and quite a number of generals and staff officers are there, and it looks very much like business. We sit about on sandbags, smoking and amuse ourselves, looking at the bursting of our shells when they do burst. The guns of Fort Wood and Fort Negley to the south firing at Confederate targets along Missionary Ridge. And as this gentleman says, about half past two, General Thomas's troops move out in front of us as if in review. By heavens, it is a splendid sight to see for one who hath no friend, no brother there. Um, the enemy from Missionary Ridge and near the rifle pits look at the show, supposing no doubt it is a review. At about 2.30, a long line of battle is formed, more than a mile in length, and just in front of us. The skirmishers move forward, and then the whole line advances. Advancing directly towards Orchard Knob is the brigade commanded by August Villick. Its skirmishers are the men of the 8th Kansas. That regiment 
um, deployed um, their skirmish line double the uh, intervals between the men reduced to uh, to just four paces presses forward and the by then very nervous confederates along the line here at orchard knob in particular the men of the 24th alabama in this area and just to their left or south the men of the 28th um, alabama also of manigo's brigade they having moved to their positions um, drop into their rifle pits and quickly um, fire between the skirmishers will um, will erupt. But the mass of the uh, the Union force, um, the um, Woods Division moving in mass directly towards um, these points will push the Confederate skirmishers back. Um, and uh, Villex and Hazen's men move directly to the front. Colonel Davis well, it continues in his letter to, um, to describe that, um, um, that advance. <clears throat> I remained in my position until I heard the order given to forward. I then came down and went to the center of a small breastwork which had been thrown up and which was the point designated for the skirmishers to rally at, at when driven back. Our line of skirmishers made but slight resistance before it gave way and fell back gradually, skirmishing all the way until they reached the breastwork. Here I rallied them for some minutes and returned the fire of the enemy. Immediately in front of our line, the small undergrowth was so dense that it was impossible to see any distance in front. I turned and moved forward, or to move towards the left, intending to go up on the slope of the hill in order to get a view of the enemy as he approached and had gone but a few steps when the whole line gave way and looking to the front I saw the enemy's front line of battle within a few steps of the breastworks. The 28th Alabama Regiment was to my left but there was an interval of some few hundred yards between it and my regiment and the interval uh, or in the interval were through the two hills which immediately hid um, it, the 28th from me. I knew it was useless to attempt much of a resistance with this large um, uh, gap between us and, I, and that if I succeeded in holding the enemy in check in my front he would come in between the two hills on my left and get in my rear and cut off my retreat. I fell back to the foot of the ridge according to previous instructions. Little resistance is put up by um, Davis and his 24th Alabama. Um, the, the size of the federal force just being um, too extensive. And as Davis's men withdraw back towards the rifle pits at the base of the ridge, August Villick's men, led by the um, 8th Kansas skirmishers, will surge forward and come up on to the crest of Orchard Knob itself. To the left, the 28th Alabama um, uh, will put up a little more resistance and actually slow Hazen's advance and inflict a few more casualties on um, Hazen's brigade than the 24th Alabama had inflicted on Villick's brigade. However, as Davis had um, anticipated, the fact that his regiment and the 28th were not really tied in, that there was no real defensive scheme for defending Orchard Knob, meant that the 28th Alabama will quickly be flanked by the advance of Hazen's brigade, um, and it will um, have to abandon its position. But in the process, many of its men will become casualties and Hazen's men will move up onto the crest of the ridge uh, or the crest of the rise um, uh, in its front um, as well. And the Federals then control the two principal points on the Confederate skirmish or picket line in front of Chattanooga. Park historian Jim Ogden now stands forward facing at the crest of Orchard Knob in a mowed grassy area. Behind him are groups of trees 
and in the distance a little ways rises Missionary Ridge. As Villex and Hazen's men seize the high points of Orchard Knob and extend um, their line on forward um, uh, down the eastern slope of Orchard Knob, they uh, can observe the, more clearly the Confederate field fortifications along the low rise of ground at the western base of Missionary Ridge. They can also see Confederates forming up. They can hear the long roll being beat on the drums in the Confederate camps, mostly located between the rifle pits at the base of the ridge and where the ridge really begins to rise steeply that couple of hundred yards. They can see soldiers forming up on their color lines, taking their arms and units moving towards the, uh, the field fortifications. They can hear the assembly being sounded on the, uh, the bugle calls. They can see artillery batteries taking positions um, as well. Um, and as these observations of Confederate troops taking position along their line at the base of the ridge are made, the information that Grant had, um, had desired is gained. While they had seen Confederate units moving um, over the ridge the day before, it, there does not appear to be any evidence that the main body of the Confederate Army is leaving Chattanooga. The main body must still be here. For Grant, that is good because he wants to strike a blow against Bragg drive Bragg south into Georgia so he can then send a relief force towards Knoxville. And Bragg now still seems to be here um, and Grant now hopes to be able to strike that blow. Having gained that intelligence and that information, but also recognizing that by having gained Orchard Knob, the Army of the Cumberland is now no longer cooped up in that one square mile area in the bend of the Tennessee River where they had been essentially for the last two months. They now have some maneuver room. In fact, as Hazen and Villick's men secure their positions here at Orchard Knob, the two divisions of Howard's 11th Corps have marched across the rear of Wood's formation and formed up in the Sitico Creek Valley to the north and move out and drive the Confederate picket and skirmish line back in that area as well. Now the Army of the Cumberland, supported by the 11th Corps, has got maneuver space, space by which they can shift to the uh, left, potentially to support Sherman's move, which, as Grant learns also on the 23rd, is going to be able to be conducted that amphibious assault across the Tennessee River on the 24th, because on the 23rd, enough of Sherman's men are finally getting in to the hidden camps in the hills of Stringer's Ridge. And so the Army of the Cumberland is ordered um, to stay out here at um, Orchard Knob, and its troops deployed in the, uh, the uh, valley, the low ground just beyond um, Orchard Knob, begin to build some crude field fortifications. And here on Orchard Knob itself, works begin to be built um, as well. In infantry positions here on the, um, just forward of the crest of Orchard Knob, um, overlooking the valley to the east, um, and on the very crest of the hill, a parapet built for the guns of Bridges Illinois Battery, which would be brought out and put into this position as well. And Orchard Knob then, as the 24th of November comes and Grant's main assault is launched, Sherman's amphibious assault across the Tennessee River, Orchard Knob then becomes, that mo um, it's, it takes on its most famous role as that command post or observation post for senior Union leaders. In Confederate hands the last two months, Orchard Knob now is that observation point for so many of the, senior, of the senior Union leadership as they look into the Chattanooga Valley on November the 24th, the day of Grant's main attack. The images shown throughout this program are audio described as follows. Image number one, a black and white photo of Confederate Brigadier General 
Arthur Manigo, of his head and face only, prematurely balding, with thin hair and thin beard. Image number two, a black and white photo of Confederate Brigadier General James Patton Anderson, seated, forward-facing, with dark hair combed to the side and full dark mustache and mutton chops, wearing a gray Confederate general's coat with three stars within a wreath on the collar. Image number three, a black and white pre-war photo of Confederate Colonel Newton Davis, seated, forward-facing, with hair combed back and clean-shaven, wearing a dark civilian dress coat, white shirt, and white bow tie. Image number four, a black and white photo of Union Major General Ulysses S. Grant, seated with body slightly turned to the left and face turned slightly right, with dark hair combed back and full dark beard, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number five, a black and white photo of Union Major General William Tecumseh Sherman, forward-facing, with head slightly turned to the left, with thinning hair and beard, wearing a white shirt and black necktie, and a dark blue Union General's coat, with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number six, a black and white photo of Union Major General George Thomas, seated, with body slightly turned to the left, and head turned slightly left, with dark hair combed back and full graying beard, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number seven, a black and white photo of Union Major General Montgomery Meigs, standing with body slightly turned to the left with arms crossed in front, with thinning gray hair combed back and full gray beard, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number eight, a black and white sketch by Theodore Davis of the Union Signal Station situated on Cameron Hill, showing Union soldiers in the bottom left corner, some sitting, some standing, and one waving a white signal flag with a red square in the center. A Union soldier sits on a limb high in a tree, looking out over the city of Chattanooga as a ladder is situated against the tree. Missionary Ridge rises in the background. Image number nine, a black and white photo of Union Major General Gordon Granger, forward-facing, with thick dark hair and thick dark beard wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number 10, a black and white sketch of Union Major General John Palmer, forward facing with thick dark hair and a thick goatee, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number 11, a black and white photo of Union Brigadier General Thomas J. Wood standing, forward facing, with right hand on a wooden chair, with light hair and dark full beard, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with one star within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number 12, a black and white photo of Union Brigadier General August Village seated forward-facing, with head slightly turned to the right, prematurely balding, with dark full beard, wearing a white shirt and black necktie, and a dark blue Union General's coat, unbuttoned, with one star within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image 13, a black and white photo of Union Brigadier General William B. Hazen, seated, forward-facing, with dark hair combed to the right and full dark Napoleon III imperial facial hair piece 
wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with one star within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number 14, a black and white photo of Union Brigadier General Sam Beatty, seated, forward facing, but slightly turned to the left, with dark hair combed to the left, and full dark goatee, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with one star within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number 15, a black and white photo of earthworks on Orchard Knob. A puddle of water is just below a mound of dirt and rocks as Missionary Ridge rises in the background. Image number 16, video panning from left to right showing cannons, monuments, and iron tablets marking Union positions situated on the crest of Orchard Knob. 